Hello. Hello. <laughs> um, let me just kind of preface this by uh, saying this is a talk about um, someone I've, I've kind of studied for a lot of years. Uh, my background is as a magician, professional magician, uh, for a lot of years. And Chung Ling Su uh, at one point was probably the most famous magician uh, in the UK. Uh, this is his letterhead uh, here. He was operational between about kind of 1880 and 1918, uh, and there's a centenary this month, which is why I'm kind of doing this talk, really, but we'll come to that in a minute. Um, so his imagery was, as you can see, this, this very, you know, leaving very little room for writing a letter on his uh, letterhead. It was all about the image. And he sold himself on the basis of um, kind of his, well, his posters said everything. I'm going to whiz through these very quickly because they, they, they mean he had literally dozens and dozens of these very elaborate posters, most of them uh, which just had his name on them and very little else. Because uh, this was a time, he was famous in the UK from about 1900 onwards. Uh, and this was a time when basically uh, the only way you could advertise yourself was through uh, newspapers or posters. There was nothing else, there was no radio, there was no TV or whatever. So he had these beautiful um, kind of full colour things done. Um, and if, if anything at all, he just had you know, his name and a, uh, a one-line slogan, or um, one of these particular illusions. This was a thing, the birth of Pearl, where there was an empty giant uh, clamshell, it closed and then he, uh, he poured some water into it, and then his assistant, Sui Seen, appeared from that. Um, they're, um, the beautiful things, I'm actually lucky enough to own a couple of these, and they're quite valuable now. This is him doing the, um, the, the famous Chinese linking ring trick that he popularised. Um, this is sort of quite a nice little kind of jokey story. He's ten assistants, as in his fingers and thumbs, although he did have about ten actual assistants as well. Um, this is one of the posters that I've got um, at home, which is uh, him doing the smoke vase trick, where he'd uh, show an empty glass vase, <laughs> cover it and then blow smoke towards it and when you took the cover off it would be full of thick white smoke. Um, the landscape ones as opposed to the portrait uh, ones are uh, a lot rarer um, but there's still a few of these. This is the other one I've got um, which are a lovely little line on there. Spellbound they gathered far and near to scan the weird powers of this wondrous man. So he was so famous at the time that he didn't actually have to have uh, the theatre or the dates or the timings or anything like that on the posters. He literally just plastered the town with all these kind of dozens of different ones and people would assume he was at the main <laughs> theatre, you know, uh, go and get tickets. This was his uh, assistant, he was also his wife, Sui Seen, um, the uh, two of them together. Um, this is what he actually looked like, um, that was a photograph of him. Um, as I say, he became famous about sort of 1900 uh, in the UK. Uh, he did previously sort of become quite well known in Paris uh, and also uh, in the United States. Um, that's in there. Uh, the interesting thing happened, uh, well, that's his kind of uh, nephew uh, who he travelled with. Um, the interesting thing happened kind of, um, well, March the 24th, 1918, to be honest was the time. That's an exhibit, by the way, from the Magic Circle headquarters with his original set of, of Chinese Lincoln rings. Um, this was a trick he became famous for, uh, condemned, by, uh, condemned to death by the boxers. And this was him doing um, a version of the bullet catch trick. Uh, and so what he'd do is get, uh, usually it was actually two people, uh, sometimes as many as half a dozen, uh, he'd get two people in the audience and he generally asked for someone who was a previously military personnel uh, to come up on stage. Uh, he never spoke, by the way. He had a guy on stage who translated for him. Uh, and I, I, a guy who actually in the end turned out to be Japanese rather than Chinese. And he'd get this guy uh, to, to ask for volunteers from the audience to come up. Uh, they'd mark their uh, initials on an old-fashioned lead bullet, um, or shot rather, um, that had been loaded into sort of a, a muzzle-loading rifle. Uh, the, the reason he used more than one person for this is so that if anything went wrong, uh, they didn't blame any particular one of them. And then he'd actually, rather than catch it in his mouth, which is the kind of common version today, he'd catch it on a china plate, uh, a little pattern plate held to his chest. So, March 24th, um, 1918, uh, 100 years ago this month, he was doing this at the Wood Green Empire. 
uh, in North London. And it was the end of the show. His show typically consisted of, he'd have a live orchestra, as I say, he never spoke. He'd have all the assistants kind of wheeling stuff on and on, uh, on and off. And he'd, he'd basically do anything from a 20 minute to an hour and a half show. Uh, sometimes, because he was kind of a headliner in, in music hall, uh, he'd, he'd always be the top of the bill. But sometimes he'd do kind of 25 minutes at the end. Uh, more often than not, he'd do the full show. And because he didn't speak, that was a lot of material, you know, and he'd do everything from uh, I think called aerial fishing, where he'd have a bamboo fishing rod and uh, put a bit of carrot on the end of it and flick it towards the audience and then a live goldfish would appear um, on the end of the thing, which he'd put into a glass bowl. Um, he'd do uh, versions of, uh, kind of variations on fire eating, where he'd stuff cotton wool into his mouth and then blow sparks out of it and eventually light things from it. Um, he'd do the big illusions like the birth of the pearl. Uh, he was a great inventor. But this was the sort of piece of resistance at the end. And um, this was obviously, you know, a few years after the time when there was a whole political situation internationally with the Chinese boxers and the rebellion. Um, so he'd do this as kind of a, a demonstration somehow of, 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 of him being beneficent but also all-powerful as a magician. On this occasion, on the 24th of March, um, he, uh, he got the assistants to load the, the marks shot into the muzzle. Uh, the two guys who were World War I Tommies um, fired the shots and at that point he dropped to his knees and shouted out, something's gone wrong. Which surprised the audience because him being Chinese and not speaking any English um, you know, well, Kev was a bit of a surprise, obviously. At um, that point, the curtain was brought down. Uh, they used a bit of a kind of backdrop to kind of cover him to keep him warm because he was struggling. He'd actually been shot in the chest, it had gone drastically wrong. And that's the point where, um, well, he got taken to hospital uh, within, uh, I think it was 12, 14 hours, he died, and the audience found out um, that he was actually this guy. Um, William Ellsworth Robinson, uh, who was born in New York uh, in 1861 uh, to parents who were of Scottish descent. Um, they were called uh, James Campbell and Sarah Robinson. Uh, his father had been a kind of man of musical, uh, kind of, well, musical stroke brothel in New York, in Manhattan. And so young Billy Robinson had grown up as part of a show of his thing. So, uh, but managed to sustain a career for the best you know, couple of decades um, as a Chinese man. Um, so this was a time when, certainly in show business, above anything else, cultural appropriation was just a thing. It was going to, you know, the days, you know, the black and white minstrel type situation. Um, but this is what the guy actually looked like. Uh, so just to remind you again of the, the, the photograph of him once he became Chung Wing Su, and the, this is an actual photograph. Uh, it's quite a transformation, really. Um, you know, nowadays we might look at that and think, actually, you know, in retrospect, he does look quite occidental. Um, but in those days, remembering that people in general didn't travel much, and that all the publicity was done through the posters uh, and all the rest of it, he basically passed for being a Chinese person. One of the, one of the most amusing things was that when he did press interviews, he'd do it through his translator, who I mentioned was Japanese. So basically, he's just talking nonsense, and the guy's guessing what his response is, and then making up his own version for the reporter. Uh, so this is him in his later years off stage, and it, and it is quite interesting that they, they, I've heard kind of anecdotal uh, sort of evidence of of people saying when he walked on stage, he did just dramatically change in terms of his uh, his whole body language. You know, uh, this is the last known photograph of him uh, out of uh, Mufti so to speak. Um, he, ended, he started off working for uh, a guy called Herman, uh, Alexander Herman, Herman the Great in America, who was a French magician working in the States. And this is, his actual moustache and beard is where the whole magical cliche comes from, basically, of, of magicians looking like that. He was the first one, and then a bit later was a guy called Dante, who stage name was Dante, who, who looked similarly. But uh, this guy was kind of working around the 1880s, 1890s, <coughs> Um, so basically, Billy Robinson worked as a support act and as assistant to this guy, um, and this, interestingly enough, is one of his most famous tricks, the bullet catching feat. So this is where he obviously got the original idea from and came up with his version of it. Uh, 
Um, but in incidentally, there have been 13 magicians killed so far doing a version of Bullet Cash. Um, this is a guy called Harry Keller, who was a very famous magician in the, in the States, just uh, pre-Houdini. Uh, the way it tended to work in the Victorian era is that magicians, uh, there was always kind of like one really famous one, uh, and then they kind of handed on their one to the next. So Keller was pre-Houdini, um, uh, pre uh, there was a guy called Thurston, uh, in, in the UK we had someone called Masculine, there were three generations of the Masculine uh, dynasty. Um, and then we have David Devant and, and so it goes on. So this is uh, Keller, interesting enough, meeting a magician who's called Ching Ling Fu. Yeah. So Ching Ling Fu is basically where Robinson nicked his uh, image and his name from. Ching Ling Fu was actually a genuine Chinese magician and he became famous in the States uh, around about sort of 1890s. And um, he, he issued a challenge uh, for someone who could duplicate his feats, one of which was producing a giant uh, bowl of water from underneath his Chinese robes. And there's a film uh, called uh, Magic in the Moonlight, which is the last Woody Allen, uh, Woody Allen movie, or last but one, whichever. Uh, and that's basically the story of Chung Ling Su, named, I think, closer to Chung Ling Fu, but with the character more uh, off stage as a Houdini. It's very kind of contrived. But Ching, Chung Ling Fu is basically where the name came from. And then they, Chung Ling Su and Ching, Ching Ling Fu had this lifelong spat, basically, between the two of them, where they issued each other's challenges and, uh, and all the rest of it. But um, what was happening was um, Robinson was working um, with, between Keller uh, and Herman, uh, basically nicking ideas off one or the other. Uh, Robinson was a great inventor of tricks, uh, but basically um, these various people wanted to keep their, uh, their secrets to themselves, so to speak. But he was actually playing them off. So he would actually go to the other one and go, well, I could come on tour with you and offer you this illusion and the secrets of the other guy. And so he's quite a, a, a devious character in that respect. Uh, this is um, Ching Ling Fu with Houdini. Uh, Houdini was also uh, a contemporary, a friend of Chung Ling Su's um, and Chung Ling, Ching Ling Fu. That must have been confusing with the Christmas cards. <laughs> 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 But, um, but yeah, Houdini was about, I think he was 13 years younger than Robinson. <coughs> and so, uh, again, they were all kind of writing to each other and playing each other off in terms of loyalties, you know. Um, so, um, the, the interesting thing about Chung Ling Su, uh, when he actually came to do this particular trick on this occasion, was how, what actually happened. Uh, there's a lot of people uh, still kind of rumour over these days about the fact that um, I mean, Robinson's home life was very complicated. He originally got married to a girl and then left that particular uh, girl after getting married for his new assistant, who was Sui Seen, whose real name was Dot. Uh, well, actually, no, it wasn't even that. Her real name was Olive, but she called herself Dot. There's a whole line of, of, uh, of lying, basically. And uh, so he, he basically um, then uh, couldn't get married to Dot because he couldn't get divorced from his original wife, but ended up with another woman anyway. So there were kind of like sort of three women involved in his life. Um, his wife ended up living with Frank, his Japanese interpreter, in London, <laughs> while he was visiting his mistress in Plymouth, and it was all very, very complicated. Um, but I also forget how famous he was as well. He, he had a house in Barnes, which I've visited. Uh, in South London, and, and you know, uh, he had two houses together, in fact, <coughs> and a workshop at the bottom of the garden, which are now probably worth, you know, kind of like five million between them. Um, so he, he's a guy who was kind of travelling around the country, had this incredibly um, uh, complicated home life, and yet the public still thought he was a Chinese guy, despite the fact that he'd retained a Scottish accent from his parents in New York. <laughs> it's not a simple story. Um, but what happened on this occasion um, is the, the version of the trick he was doing was with very old-fashioned um, musket rifles. So even in the First World War, they would have been pretty much obsolete, and he'd used them for years. And the methodology was that while his, his uh, not quite wife, but supposed wife, uh, Doc, was in the audience at Sui C, uh, collecting these marked bu uh, bullets, she'd basically switched them so that the bullet that got, or the shot that got loaded into the rifle, uh, was a, a duplicate one. Now on the old fashioned muskets, there's a, a tube underneath which is um, to hold the ramrod. 
So what you have is a, a duplicate um, a charge in the bottom of that, and that's what actually fired. So the top part of the rifle didn't actually fire with a fake bullet. Meanwhile, the actual marked bullet got passed to him secretly. So he'd been using these rifles for so long that a little fracture had appeared uh, between the bottom uh, firing mechanism and the top one, and so the duplicate bullet actually on this occasion got fired because the, uh, the, the kind of power had trickled through. And that's what happened. But people still like to believe that because he kind of uh, had all these complicated home life situations and all the rest of it, they think that he was either deliberately committing suicide, odd way to do it, um, or he had a kind of lot of business rivals who might have kind of set it up, uh, you know, for him for him to be shot. But the you know the truth of the matter is, in, in any conspiracy theory, is usually not that interesting. That's why we believe in conspiracy theories. I think is because they're just more fun. Um, so basically, this guy um, ended up, you know, he's, he's, he's lost in history. Basically, despite being one of the most famous magicians ever, uh, the only thing he's ever remembered for at all. <coughs> is because of a trick going wrong, you know. Um, a couple of years ago, um, a little bit of film footage came out about him. Now, until this point, no one knew uh, that there was anything um, uh, surviving of him. And a friend of mine in Brighton, I live in Brighton, uh, and, a, and a guy uh, called Stuart McKay, uh, he's an archive um, researcher. He was doing a, a TV series that was involved in called Just Magic, a BBC Two thing. About, it's going to be about five years ago now, and he was looking at old tapes of various things, the Pathé newsreel reels and all the rest of it, and he just noticed on the end of it, there was this odd bit of footage, and he kind of had a look at this and asked me about it and the rest of it, and uh, turns out that this is the only known surviving piece of footage of Chung Ling Su, which is when he was meeting um, uh, basically people who had been injured during the war, and uh, doing a kind of whole... Um, uh, I don't know, a kind of publicity stunt really, but just to kind of like um, a launch a charity initiative. But there are 14 seconds of this, uh, and so this, this is the only known footage of Chung Ling Soon. So, <laughs> the, the, the master magician comes up next. Right? He haunts me. Um, so yeah, so basically, uh, it, it's just an interesting thing that although he didn't disguise the fact that he was Chinese in his, his regular life, it's almost as, as though the entire British public wanted to believe he was Chinese. And so there's a kind of thorny subject of cultural appropriation, you know, as, as I'm doing with the shirt. Um, but but the, the interesting thing is that he actually promoted the idea of a Chinese person being not just mysterious, but actually very graceful, uh, very skilled, and all the rest of it. So, yeah, I just find it really interesting that, although it's kind of, you know, everybody these days knocks the whole idea of the black and white minstrels and all that kind of uh, uh, idea, um, with someone something like this, uh, I notice if you look at the comments under the, the YouTube video of that, people are going, oh, it's disgusting that this guy is impersonating a Chinese person, all the rest of it. But he was actually doing a very positive thing in, in the sense that he was, uh, you know, admiring the skill of the other person. <laughs> Even though he nicked Chin Chin and Fu's act, he was actually promoting the idea uh, of exoticism in the sense that people from other cultures had superior skills. You know, so it's an interesting way to look at it. Uh, but anyway, it's, uh, it's a centenary of him being shot. Uh, in two weeks' time, and that's the reason for doing this talk, not as a celebration, but just as a commemoration, um, because I've got a big interest in basically people who uh, were very famous but lost to history. You know, I think there's a, um, if you look at the history books, um, all the famous people that we know, it's all great to study that, but I think if you just scratch below the surface, there's a lot more interesting people that, unless we're careful, will be consigned to history. So uh, there we are, the inscrutable chumming soon. Fabulous, what a fabulous story. I had no, I had no clue, but then this is the lovely thing about the brother. Paul, are you having to take Yeah, absolutely. Questions? And I, I should, uh, yeah, and I brought, I, yeah. I've got one of his letterheads as well. I was going to see that afterwards. Oh, that's, uh, wow. that's an original one, um, which I'm kind of, that, that and a couple of posters and an autograph are amongst my most prized possessions, really. Yeah. Fabulous. Well, this is, 
this is the thing about the Bible, that we never know what we're going to get and we hear these wonderful stories. So does anybody have any questions for Paul? How do you do the trick? That's what I want to know. But uh, yeah. <laughs> anybody got any questions? And if there are, then I'll take... Oh, yes. Zephyr. Um, I too have an interest in Edwardian figures who pretended to be someone else. And it seemed to be something that was really um, uh, quite prominent at the times. Are you thinking about doing uh, some more talks on people in Edwardian times who are pretending to be from different cultures? Um, I've, I've kind of more, it's more kind of people behind the scenes. I mean, I've kind of, the past couple of years, I've done a play, a kind of one-man play thing called Linking Rings, which is basically about Houdini's right-hand man. Um, so, you know, Houdini, everybody knows, he's the only famous magician of that era that, whose name is still in day-to-day -day usage. But actually, he had a right-hand man called Jim Collins, and, and Collins is my original family name, and so I took an interest in that and kind of wrote a play about that. Um, but it, it, yeah, it, it is interesting. I mean, before I just should mention as well, before Chun Ling Su became Chun Ling Su, he was. Uh, let me just grab uh, that note. So yeah, it's only something that's coming quite recently. Uh, he originally called himself Hop Sing Su, um, and then it was a, a promoter who suggested that he should rip off further Chun Ling Fu. But before that, he was also uh, known as an Egyptian magician when he, when he was working with um, Herman and Keller. Uh, he built himself as Ahmed Ben Ali, uh, as an Egyptian magician, um, and he basically ripped that idea off Ben Ali Bey, who was uh, a magician who was actually from Germany. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so there's all of this kind of stuff going on, but it, it was a time when basically um, anything foreign was exotic, yeah. you know. So, uh, and I think. And there Exactly. So local people filled in the role. Yeah, and if you look to, you know, I mean, I've got a real thing about uh, mediums and psychics, you know, I spend half my time arguing, uh, usually in a court, about things, but they, uh, <laughs> uh, 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 but they um, if you go back to those days, your equivalent of psychic Sally Morgan or Derek Akora then would have been a, a guy called Alexander who was uh, an American guy, but wore a turban on stage, and all these kind of dressings were Egyptian curtains, Chinese rugs, Indian, whatever. Um, and it was because they associated anything that was kind of spiritual, or, uh, you know, with uh, being overseas, you know, which is kind of understandable. But also, it was a time when pre-movies and pre, or, you know, pre, um, most movies, um, and, and any, obviously, TV and all the rest of it, the big visual, the, the whole point of theatre was that a, a musical and a vaudeville is it was this escape. And so you had to provide a visual. And so the way of doing a nice visual on the stage was of course dressing it with oriental things, you know, um, rather than tartan uh, or anything else. So it was just the association with, you know, so it's, it's, there's a tendency to think it was in somehow kind of racist and undoubtedly in some respects it was. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. But, it, but it's interesting because I've, I've thought about doing. We were just talking about it earlier about doing a, a, a one-man play about Chun Ling Su. And the problem is that with it, it's not particularly character-wise a likable guy. Uh, but also, it's getting round the the cultural appropriation situation for a modern audience. You know, because it, you'd spend so much time trying to explain why it wasn't necessarily a negative, rather than actually just doing a show, didn't we? Yeah, no, it's a, it's a point. Yeah, there's a hand. Is it possible? Yeah, it's, yeah. it's based in. Um, well, we've got a two-part question. Um, so firstly, and in, in the answer you've just given, I'm guessing he took on this Asian persona as to commercial advantage. Was he a particularly talented music, uh, magician, or was he particularly prominent because he took on this Asian persona? Uh, a, a bit of both, but he was actually a very talented magician. He was a great inventor. Um, and he, he was actually involved in early aviation as well, oddly enough. There's a link there with Houdini, but that's another talk. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, Houdini was the first person to fly a plane in Australia um, and uh, signed over his plane to uh, Donald Stevenson's, uh, sorry, to Chung Su's assistant, Donald Stevenson. Um, and I've, I've got a whole thing where I've been trying to find out what happened to the plane after that point. Um, but to, back to the staying on subject, the, um, he was a better magician than Ching Ling Fu, apparently. So Ching Ling Fu had about three really good tricks um, and made his name with that. 
but he also had a lot of support acts uh, helping him out and did quite a, a short show. Um, so basically what, um, what uh, Chun Wing Su did was capitalise on the success of this guy mm -hmm. and you know, appropriate the name uh, and all the rest of it, but he did a full evening show and was apparently uh, a, a fantastic magician. He's still, still to this day, he's considered one of our, you know, our best magicians, but uh, you know, one of America's best magicians, yeah. Brilliant. Excellent. Any any more any more questions, <coughs> Paul? You're you're ruling Paul Daniels out of that, that list of uh, <laughs> top magicians. <laughs> <Well, laughs> but, but, but you know that, that but that demonstrates the point. If you remember the eighties and nineties, there was only in the UK there was only Paul Daniels magic wise, you know, yeah, yeah. Uh, and that's the way it's always worked. So at, at this point. He was the guy. You know. Do we have someone now? Is it oh, someone I suppose Dynamo has been the recent yeah, sort of yeah. one, but it's kind of uh, I don't know. It's kind of TV magicians now has gone gone that little kind of weird route because of things like Britain's Got Talent in terms of its team stuff and competitive. You know, so you got Penn and Teller's Fools and and uh, you got and, Darren Brown and you've got all of that. Yeah, and I suppose that's Darren, Darren Brown is the closest equivalent these days. Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. yeah, but less on the tricks and more on the kind of the, 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 the mind stuff. Well, disguising magic tricks as Within. mind stuff. Okay. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> any any last questions, for Paul, before we take a break? Yeah, I mean, you're going to be around, aren't you, for a bit? You've got those. Um... There's one quick one there, I think. Yeah, sorry, I can't. Yeah, Paul yeah. just wanted that, that you talked about the um, going um, underneath the surface for the assistants and getting in their sort of history and this sort of thing. Mm. Um, do you feel it's been better because of television? <coughs> where assistants have been. Um, more recognised. Um, for instance, I particularly know that um, one of the um, makers of tricks, if you like, the makers of tricks for Paul Daniels was a chap called Givlini. And, yeah, sure. And you know, and the credits come up and you see these people. I think Ali Bongo was was, was yeah, but Ali, Ali Bongo was a long term sister for David Nixon yeah. before yeah. Paul Daniels yeah. as well. So yeah, yeah. They get uh, these days. They, in those days, they with the television. Uh, those type of they got from yeah, you know, pre-TV, nothing was credited. Yeah, obviously, you know. Um, and I, I sort of, I, I've got a fascination with that idea of people who are involved in show business and do appear on stage, but don't have the ego. Yeah. Um, so they, you know, they're quite happy to be the sidekick uh, to someone else. You know, and I think that's a fascinating thing because you think the reason most people get involved in show business is because they want to show off. Um, and actually, you know, that the, the idea of the backroom wizard is, is, a, is a really interesting one, and, and also the idea of mentors. You know, I think men, the, 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 there's a TV series or radio series waiting to be made about people's mentors. I think. You know. Brilliant. Are there any last questions? I didn't see that one. So I'm going to just stand. The lights are a bit uh, right. If not, to, no, no, yeah, they are exactly in an auction, isn't it? To, don't, <laughs> don't, 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 don't. Um, if no more questions, then I'm going to stop it there.